Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, hands-on software architect, and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, Lesson 39, we'll be taking a look at integration hubs, uh, otherwise known as ESBs or Enterprise Service Buses. I want to start by really analyzing whether we need an integration hub and what they can really do for us. So let's suppose we have three systems, system A and system B that communicate through messaging and system C that communicate all through messaging. In this particular case, we don't necessarily need an integration hub because this is fairly simple communications between three systems. However, systems tend to evolve. Let's say we have system D that requires FTP communication, and system A has to communicate that. So system A is going to communicate using FTP. Then we have system E up here that's maybe external and requires REST. And so system B needs to communicate with that system, but then so does system A. And we start to realize now it's starting to look like a little bit of a spaghetti mess. But let's analyze really if we need an integration hub here. Because watch what happens. System B right here chooses to go to REST instead of messaging. Now that's a simple protocol change, but because everything is tightly bound, look what happens. System A has to be modified to communicate to system B through REST, and so does system C. And so one change of a very simple change of saying we're going to move from messaging to REST has implications across our entire system. Furthermore, let's analyze system A right here and notice the dependencies, the tight coupling between every system here. If system E at the top or B or C or even D change, it's going to require a change to system A. And so this, is, this whole topology right here is highly uh, tightly coupled. So what I want to do is convert this to a different topology using an integration hub or an ESB. And notice now, everything is still communicating the same way it was before. But now all those routes or routes are going through the integration hub. Now let's analyze and let's take a look at system B to convert back to messaging. Yeah, REST wasn't the greatest idea. Let's move back to messaging. The question is, what impact is there in every other system? And the answer is none. And because I changed to talk to the integration hub through messaging, but that is decoupled so that no other system has to even be aware that system B is now using messaging. As a matter of fact, let's analyze system A and notice that while I have all the coupling levels here still, I'm, or all the communication levels, I'm now highly decoupled in the fact that, look at this, system A only uses messaging. FT, I can communicate to system D on FTP, system C on REST, system E on REST, and system B through some other maybe sort of messaging through that integration hub. And so now let's analyze the integration hub in terms of its overall capabilities because really what the integration hub is doing, and as a matter of fact, I want to go backwards one to actually really emphasize this point. Because what the integration hub is actually doing, it's allowing each system to evolve independently of any other system. And that's that level of abstraction supplied by an integration hub. And so it does allow for that independent evolution of each system. As a matter of fact, let's analyze these capabilities further. And so message enhancement, in other words, changing the, the body of the message to either enhance it, supplement information, or convert data is one of the capabilities. As a matter of fact, message transformation is another. Now, the difference between enhancement and transformation Enhancement deals with the actual uh, payload of the message, whereas transformation really is involved in the format of the message. Uh, then we have protocol transformation, uh, the ability to go from one protocol, i.e. REST, over to another protocol, such as AMQP or even SOAP to ATMI. You know, these are protocol transformations that the integration hub can do, further decoupling systems. It can handle service orchestration so that system A does need to communicate with E and B. That orchestration can be handled through that integration hub. And it can also handle registry and discovery of services as well so that system A doesn't need to even be concerned about where this particular order 
is going to be placed. It just simply sends an order into the integration hub and that can orchestrate as well as discover what services are there. Uh, security can be handled through the integration hub as well, as well as this overall system abstraction and evolution. Um, adding another system in here, tying it to that integration hub does not impact other systems. So let me show you the contract decoupling as the last part because this really is uh, an important aspect of the integration hub. Let's say that we have a business service or external service um, that needs to talk to an enterprise service and we're going to order um, products. Now the business services or all our input from maybe uh, third party uh, vendors or B2B all communicates to REST. However, we've got a, a old legacy EJB application in Java using RMI over IIOP. And so we start to see our first problem. I'm communicating with REST. All of our B2B folks communicate with REST. However, my contract says that you need to supply me a SKU, a stock, keep, stock keeping unit, as well as a date in MMDDY format. And that's our contract, not only with all of our internal applications to place orders, but also external vendors as well. The enterprise service, however, unfortunately is implemented uh, requiring an internal product ID, uh, a quantity, and a date in Oracle yyyy.mm.dd format. And so you can start to see this, this, this coupling level here of the fact that we choose to implement that order entry system with an internal product ID, but we don't want to expose our internal product IDs to outside vendors. And so let's see what the integration hub can do because I'm going to place an order in XML format with this stock keeping unit 184684538 with a date in MMDDYY format, November 2nd, 2018. I'm going to actually submit this order. So what happens is the integration hub intercepts this and due to transformation enhancement says, hmm, I see that you need an internal product ID. Well, we have a mapping for that. So I can actually do a lookup or delegate to another service and actually convert that internal or that external SKU to an internal product ID. Also, I see that you have a date. I can do that, but you don't supply a quantity. That's right. We don't care about the quantity. We don't even know the quantity, but this enterprise service requires that quantity. So I can look that up for you. And that's exactly what the integration hub does. Notice it converted XML to Java because I am making an RMI call using EJB. And so I've that's message transformation. Um, also the enhancement, notice I've converted that SKU from 18468-4538 over to A432-98. That's our internal product ID. I converted the date and also did a lookup of the quantity. And now I can actually execute that enterprise service. This is contract decoupling. This is exactly what the integration hubs are really powerful at doing. What I'm going to do on lesson 40 is talk about the integration patterns, common integration patterns, and we're going to look inside the ESB. But this was kind of really just a uh, kind of an introduction to really say what is the use of an enterprise service bus or an integration hub. So this has been uh, lesson 39, integration hubs or ESBs. Um, again, stay tuned next week on Software Architecture Monday for a follow-up lesson on those integration patterns uh, that we can use within an ESB, those common ones. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.